Hi everyone, my name is Evie Larson from Apista Life Science. Welcome to this webinar about cloud computing and automated tests. Thanks for joining us. We aim to add some valuable content to your day here today. To do that, let me introduce my two very knowledgeable colleagues. First of all, we've got Philip Holt. He will talk to you about the cloud qualification framework. Hi, Philip. Hello. And next is Nick Larson. Nick will demonstrate how to automate manual processes and periodic reviews for the Office 365 using Automated Boost. Hey, Nick. Hi, everyone. Um, before we get into the subject matter, I just want to give you a lightning version of who we are and why Epista does webinars like this. We at Epista Life Science are a consultancy and we are dedicated to continuously improving regulatory compliance, both for our clients and the whole industry. And that's where things like this webinar come in. And I won't get into all of our services. I promised you a lightning round. So just check out epista.com, our website, to learn more about our services. Over on the practical side, let me just take care of a few um, housekeeping things here. Please chime in with your questions as we go. If we don't get to answer them because there are so many of you online today, we will do our best to get the answers afterwards to you. So send your, your questions in here by typing them into the webinar dashboard. Also, FYI, I'll send you the presentation after the webinar. And one last thing to tell you, I know I'm speed talking here, but I wanna to get to the good stuff. Uh, Nick is going to demonstrate uh, automated boost, a tool to um, use for automated testing. And if you wanna learn more about it after, the demo, after his demo, we are offering a free evaluation of your test framework. So stick around and you'll get more information about this free evaluation opportunity for you at the end of the webinar. And with that, I will turn the microphone over to Philip and he'll kick things off. Hello everybody. Um, yes. First, I'll start to talk a bit about um, everything as a service or X as a service. Um, but also today we talk about service uh, in general terms. We have multiple different setups, uh, ranging from co-location as a service, where we have but a tiny corner of a data center, all the way up to software as a service, where we have the entire IT stack residing with the service provider, and we only manage the data itself. Um, typically, what we see in our implementations are infrastructure as a service, where um, what we implement is the infrastructure up into the virtual infrastructure. Subsequently, um, there is a, a layer of software that is databases and operating systems and applications that are managed by the client or the customer. Then we also see uh, software as a service where the service provider manages the entire IT stack, all but from the, the data management itself. What is really important when we move solutions from on-prem to the cloud is the oversight. The oversight must become an integrated part of the IT control strategy because we are uh, relinquishing controls, procedural controls from the regulated company to the cloud service provider. So a quick question, something to think, think about when we talk about cloud is, the company that you come from, do you have a clear overview of all your implemented cloud solutions and the regulatory impact that they have? Just a teaser. And the reason that we're asking this question is also to get you to think, because in many cases, clouds are implement, cloud solutions are implemented, but the regulatory impact of the cloud is not necessarily taken into consideration when the cloud is implemented. As a, we, the topic today will be software as a service. You can say that software as a service is the ultimate cloud solution because we are moving uh, as much from on-prem to uh, the cloud service provider as we possibly can while still being in actual control of our data. Depending on the setup of the specific software, 
uh, different integrations may exist. We can have integrations between the software as a service and, the, and an on-prem solution. This can be an Active Directory is a good example of that. Or we can have an integration between other cloud solutions. This is integration is of course something that we that we must discuss and that we we must take into account when we qualify our software as a service. But it's not something that we're going to go in, in, into the depth with in in this seminar. Um, the solution uh, software as a service means that we retain some minor uh, configuration control of the cloud setup itself. This can be accounts, uh, specific security setups. Um, we also retain procedural control of the application and, of course, the data maintenance. But more importantly, it's not what we what we keep control of. It's also important what we relinquish control of. Um, patching of the IT stack of the underlying IT stack is something that we relinquish, relinquish control with. Um, we are not in control of the patching. We cannot. Uh, control the frequency, we cannot control which patches are installed, which patches are not installed. Um, also, we cannot control version upgrades of the software. Second, um, we're also relinquishing controls of the, of the installation and configuration and maintenance of the underlying IT stack. This could also be the operating system of the server, not the software itself, but the underlying server. It could also be uh, the firewall configurations, updates of the firewall, firewall rules, etc., but also interviews and malware. Things that we've all seen examples of in the past year, where where regulated companies have been in have been in trouble, to to put it mildly, because they have not maintained their interviews and malware on their on-prem system. So they have been in control. They've had the control, but they've not been in control. So a method to, to ensure and to minimize these risks is, of course, by moving in to the cloud, but keeping the oversight of the cloud uh, procedures. Secondly, um, physical and procedural control of the fun foundational hardware, basically the, the, the physical hardware, the, the iron, if you will, on which we, we have all our virtual setup. This is something that we, uh, must relinquish, relinquish control of regardless of the cloud solution that we take. Everything from a co-location to software as a service is residing in the physical data center of the cloud service provider. So we have, must have complete faith in their procedural controls. So when we move to, to the cloud, while we have faith in our cloud, cloud service provider, how do we become successful? How do we ensure that the controls we have are that the controls we relinquish are actually implemented with our cloud service provider. To do this, um, we follow the the known process of IT implementation. We have a planning phase, and then we have a little uh, example explicit phase, which should be part of the planning, called the exit strategy. We then have an implementation and the operation and maintenance. Um, the process, the, the dark blue processes are, should be very familiar to, to IT implementation projects. Um, and this familiarity means that first we have, uh, we get less, less pushback when we go to clients because people can recognize what we're doing. And also it means that there is a direct link to the pre-existing QMS with only minor adjustments because we're following the known procedures. And this again also makes it more easy to present to externals in case of, of inspections because it is a known process. It is something that is recognizable. So in the planning phase, we can in general terms split it up into, into three underlying topics. We have the extent of the cloud. So which what is the cloud strategy? How far do we want to go? Do we want to stay in a co-location? Do we want to have the infrastructure as a service? Or do we want to go all the way to software as a service as is the topic of the day? How many providers do we want? Do we want to stick to one provider, being it Microsoft, AWS, Google, whatever service? Do we want to stick to one or do we want to share the load and maybe, maybe share the risk between multiple service providers so we have a fallback plan? 
how who is our implementation partner do we trust them how do we have more do we have one do we do it in-house and what are the responsibilities all these should be part of the cloud strategy for implementation cloud solutions then we have the next step which is the vendor assessment is where we we evaluate the cloud service provider um, their capacity their capability of service provision uh, extent of pre-existing QMS. What is their maturity? Do they understand the business from which we come? Do they understand life science and pharmaceuticals? What, are the, what is the organizational stability? All these things should be taken into consideration when we select our vendor. And then finally, we have the service level agreement. Negotiate is in quotation marks because it is rare that we that we can actually do a, a clear negotiation with a cloud service provider. Typically, we have a set of different service levels that we agree upon, and then we, we define this and, and use this as our cloud service. And then finally, of course, we approve the cloud strategy. So this is very, very fast. It takes, this normal, this process normally takes some time, and the more time that is invested in this process, the foundation of, of the transition into the cloud, the better the transition is gonna be in our experience. So, as I promised, an exit strategy. An exit strategy should be a clear consideration and, a, and, and, a, and an integral part of your cloud transition plan. The reason is, what do you do if you want to change cloud service provider? What do you do if you want to return to on-prem? These questions are critical because it is how we retain our data. It is how, we, how, do we, uh, how are we sure to retain the control of our data in case something goes wrong with the cloud? So appropriate control should, of course, be incorporated into the SLA into contracts. Special emphasis should be put into the ability to extract data from the cloud and keep it in a format that we can use subsequently, either with a, with a re-established on-prem solution or with the cloud established as, as a secondary or third cloud provider. When we come to the implementation, um, we also have a known process. Uh, you can see we start with a qualification plan and we end up with a qualification report. Um, these are all known documents where we have the scope, we define the extent of test, the quality goals, so on and so forth. And in the report, we report on what we've done. Instead, we will put emphasis on the middle layer because this is where it gets interesting, at least for us. This is where we differentiate our approach from the standardized implementation of IT software. And the reason that we're differentiating from the standardized, standardized approach is that we re must rely on oversight. We must rely on, in, on, on review of documentation provided by our cloud service provider. If we start by the qualification, um, we have a, we've made a link to the V model. As you can see, um, the, the technical design, the build, the functional specs, all these, all, these, uh, all these are part of the services that we buy from our cloud service provider. To a large extent, we also buy the IQ. The minimal IQ that is done is related specifically to the configuration of the cloud account, the specific environment, um, configuration of users, user groups, integration to local AD, all these things that are, are that are a keystone in our implementation. But if we consider, if we relate this to a normal IT implementation on-prem, then it's also, then it's only a, a minuscule amount of effort compared to the normal IT implementation. Tests will, will be completed and documented according to regulated company procedures. But overall, this is, what you can call a light IQ. Um, the IQ once completed will be uh, will form the basis for future baselines because we don't have an extensive configuration item list. The configuration item list consists of the specific cloud account and environment configuration and integrations. So once the first, once the deployment is done, um, we come with the cloud cloud. Um, cloud requirements and what we can call a cloud compliance verification. The cloud compliance verification consists of a, um, how to put this mildly, a massive spreadsheet. 
a massive spreadsheet where we uh, link to relevant uh, regulatory requirements. Um, generally, we link to uh, to the Euro Lake Volume 4, Annex 11, the 21 CFR Part 11, and, and related regulations. Um, we have an interpretation of, of the regulations, and then we have additional requirements based on the regulations which are specific for the regulated company. So if you look at it, columns columns one to five are requirement columns. And of these one to five, only column five is a adjustable column, if you will. It is this, it is the column that, that gives us the flavor the requirement flavor from the specific uh, regulated company. Then in the next column, we have um, the cloud service responsibilities. So the responsibilities which are, for the, the procedural responsibilities which are managed by the cloud service provider. And then we have the procedural responsibilities which are managed by the customer or the, the service taker, if you will. Finally, uh, we have uh, two columns where we reference uh, processes. We have a co the, the column where we reference the processes implemented by the cloud service provider, and we have a reference to the processes implemented by the regulatory company. The last, so if you if you will, only the fifth and the and the last column, the fifth and the ninth column, are the columns that are adjusted. The remaining columns are are unique but also generic to unique to a cloud service provider, but generic in the form that if it is an AWS solution for a given company, then AWS have the same responsibilities regardless of the customer that are taking the AWS service or Microsoft for that matter. So uh, the case that we will present, that's, that this was a lot of theory. We'll try to, to translate this into a practical case. Um, the case that we are presenting today is uh, based on Office 365. Um, therefore, we would like to do a quick poll. Um, in the poll, we have uh, four questions. Uh, no, four answers to the question, are you in control of your Office 365 solution? And as you can see, please select, uh, please select an answer, um, because it is an interesting point to see how, how do how Many of you are in fact in control of your Office 365. We'll give everybody 15 more seconds to vote. So. We have about 60% voted, so the last few of you guys, put your votes in. All righty, so we'll close the vote now, and I will show you the results. So, that is, um, that is uh, not a surprising, but yet an interesting result. Um, because we have 29 who uh, who have a qualified Office 365, which is very, very, very interesting, very, very good. Um, and then um, we also have 58% who, uh, who do not use Office 365 for regulated activities, and which is a lot given that the, given the wide use of Office 365, given the wide range of possibilities with Office 365, um, it is a very, very, uh, to me at least, bold, uh, bold decision to say we do not use Office 365 for regulated activities. But um, is there any way? Um, let's go to the case. And this case, as promised, is in fact a qualification of, a, of an Office 365 solution. Um, we, I won't be going through the, the deployment of, and the IQ because this is all uh, known stuff and this is based on, on standardized good test practice. Um, what I will do instead is I will take you through this massive, so one row of the massive spreadsheet. I think it's one of, uh, I don't know how many uh, double digit rows, I think we're talking about 80 or so rows. Anyhow, 
So the first row would be the first uh, five rows would be the requirements. Subsequently, we have the rows where we def where we re reference the custom the responsibilities bit between Microsoft Microsoft and the regulated company, and then we have the last four rows where we have the regulated company flavors. This this was in the example only one, but in this case, specific case, we've elaborated into four rows because we also used it for QMS gap analysis as part of the implementation process. Yes. So the first, the, what I'll take you through the, the requirement that you might be able to recognize from the Eurolex, from the Eurolex, um, where there should be close cooperation between all relevant personnel, such as process owner, system owner, qualified persons, and IT, and all personnel should have appropriate qualification, level of access, and so on and so forth. What we what we do is then we we make it we make a interpretation of the requirement and we make a link from the from the Eurolex to the to 21 CFR Part 11 requirements, thus documenting that this the the controls that we have oversight with the implemented processes with our service provider in this case Microsoft are actually in compliance sorry <clears throat> with both. Um, European and Ameri and US regulations. And then we have the last, where there is a um, uh, the flavor of the client, any specific interpretations, any specific requirements that are formulated in collaboration between uh, EPISTA, in this case the implementation partner, and the client. So now we reference the we we have the responsibility split, and the and how this responsibility split is defined in the available documentation from the cloud service provider. Um, first, we have the first we have the responsibilities as Microsoft defines it in the SLA with the. The standard standard Microsoft SLA with the with the with the with the regulated company, um, and we have the references to the part of the SOC two reports where the controls are implemented. The doc and these controls ensures the ensures the cooperation between the personnel and the ability to carry out the designated the assigned duties. So basically, training of people so they are qualified to do the job that they're hired to do. So first we, as I said, first we have the, the processes implemented at Microsoft. Then we have the processes implemented locally at the, locally at the regulated company. And finally, um, we have the specific Microsoft responsibilities as they defined it in the SOC 2 report made for Office 365. So Microsoft have made two reports for us. They have made one report where they define, um, where they link the Azure responsibilities, Microsoft Azure responsibilities here under Office 365 to uh, GXP, in spe rather specifically the 21 CFR and the Eudralex, which is nice of them because it makes it a lot easier. Um, and then they have made a SOC 2 report available for Office 365 where they where a third party auditor uh, have inspected the procedure the procedures implemented at Microsoft in this case the procedures specifically related to and ensuring the training of key personnel who performs tasks related to the maintenance of the IT stack for Office 365 Finally, we have the we have the processes that are implemented with the regulated company, where they define a system owner, a system responsible, and a system administrator for the Azure Office 365. We have CVs and training records ensuring the the, the training level of the of the relevant comp of the relevant personnel, and then we have logical security requirements in place. So all and then as I said. These columns will differentiate from client to client, from regulated company to regulated company, because these are the, the implementation controls uh, specifically for the uh, for the regulated company.
Finally, um, it's not enough to do the qualification. Uh, we also have some supporting documents. Um, we have the cloud strategy that we be, that we initiated in our planning phase. Um, the cloud strategy also means we need to update specific pre-existing documents. This would be user management, backup management, etc. But also based on the integration between uh, local on-prem system and other cloud systems, there may be additional procedures uh, that must be updated. Second, uh, we need some cloud retirement. We all, could, when implementing a GHP system or, or, or a system in manufacturing, we consider retirement of the system. We consider data lifecycle. We consider how do we make, how do we store our backup tapes? We should also consider cloud retirement. And this should be documented as part of the cloud strategy or as part of the cloud control O&M, if you will. If we zoom in a little bit on the cloud control O&M, then um, what we do is we define a control wheel. The wheel defines recurring activities, so activities that are occurring daily or, or on a daily or on a weekly basis. Um, this could be cloud managed, general cloud management, uh, disaster recovery from the cloud service provider. Um, monthly activities could be uh, activities such as revocation of unused accounts, so so user cleanup. Um, Periodic review, um, quarterly reviews could be periodic review of accounts and account accesses. And so you review it on a periodic basis, but every month you, you delete, once a month you delete all the accounts. Um, and then uh, yearly you would do a periodic review of the cloud compliance, basically a retake on the cloud compliance verification, because all the reports that we use to document oversights only have a limited um, validity. Typically, they are valid for some for anything between a year to two years, some maybe even shorter than that. And this means that in order to document oversight and to document control, we need to revisit these reports on a, on a basis, on a frequency defined on their validity and ensure that the cloud service providers are still in control of the processes that we expect them to be in control of because we no longer perform the processes ourselves. Many of these tasks are very, very, very time consuming and very, very, very manual. So um, for me, in many cases, these tasks are not done, which means that a, a, a regulated company that have moved into the cloud, their control and their level of control could be questioned is the right way to put it and the politically correct way to put it. But a benefit from, from the cloud is that in many cases, we have a web-based interface. And a web-based interface means that we can automate the process of maintaining control. We can automate the process of recurring activities, things that normally are point and click and jawbreakingly boring. So with this teaser, I will give the word to, uh, to Nick who will show us how we can save time and money and automate our control. Thank you, Philip. So I'm just going to take over here and show you uh, this with the automated boost um, and to show you how we uh, automate manual processes and periodic reviews. Um, so switching over to the Boost application. Today we have cheated a bit and uh, created a script uh, already for you guys to see. So uh, this script is using an extract of our test AD as a data source. I'll just show you here with uh, our users in, uh, in that Active Directory. And we'll use that list as a data source to check and go through all users uh, and see if their MFA, uh, their multi-factor authentication, is enabled or disabled. So this is the data source and here we have the script. I'll just show you the conditional step here. If we step in here, you can see that we are checking a uh, username against the name on the screen. 
and we're checking the uh, MFA status against the status on the screen. And once we have uh, evaluated this for the first user, we will take the next row in the data source and jump back and do that for all users in the Excel sheet. Okay. So let's go ahead and start the script to see how it's performing. So Boost is a uh, record and replay uh, test automation tool, which can also be used for monitoring and uh, follow up uh, on these uh, tasks, as Philip uh, mentioned. So this script will uh, evaluate a list of users and check their status on MFA. And as you see here in our test tenant, all our users have uh, disabled status and we expect that. So <clears throat> searching for each user here and checking that the status on the screen matches the status that we expect. And we have three users here that we want to check. So it's just looping back, inputting the new user and uh, checking that as well. So any second now here, it will be done. And I'll go ahead and show you the uh, the report that this script produces. So you might also notice that uh, it's highlighting uh, each uh, step it's doing. So when we're inputting into the search field, it's highlighted by this red marker. And when it's doing uh, some reading of the display name and the, the status of the authentication, it's also highlighting that. And I think Johnny Doe is the last user, so we should end up with a script that is finished and all green. So this script produces a repo that looks like this. So you're able to see all completed steps. It has the um, the screenshots, it's highlighting what it's doing, uh, and you're able to do on each step, uh, you're able to um, include a comment. So if you're referring to a specific requirement or a, uh, a task from the, the wheel that uh, Philip showed, you can have that in there as well. Scrolling down to the bottom, you are actually able to see all the data that we use in this script, and you're able to see that this is a success so we have a question here that i'm just going to speak to so do you have other applicable scripts for controlling office 365 and yes we have so there are many uh technical follow-ups will which takes a lot of time to complete uh one of them you might have seen this is uh, the message center of office 365 so this is where Microsoft pushes uh, notifications on updates, uh, issues, uh, plan for change. And um, this is actually something that you should uh, be looking at every day if you want to be in, in control of your system. There are different categories. So stay informed, uh, it, it might not be that critical. But if you have prevent or fix issues, you should uh, evaluate that if it's a feature you're using and what impact does it have? Does it have impact on your control and compliance or is it a technical impact? Um, we have plan for change as well. So that might be a bigger project. So in the uh, latest year, we, we saw that Microsoft uh, is uh, closing down Skype and moving to Teams. Uh, that might be a, a big impact on your uh, 
on your business in terms of both uh, staying in control with your data and, and also in terms of resources for making this transition to Teams a, uh, a good experience for everyone. Uh, because Skype is, is mainly communication, where Teams is uh, has a lot of integration with uh, great integrations with all uh, Microsoft's products. So you might uh, you might not know where your data end up flowing. So if you share a document, a GXP critical document in in a Teams meeting, it might end up in SharePoint. And and if you don't have a qualified cloud and, and SharePoint, uh, then you might be out of control. So uh, this is uh, one of uh, another example of scripts that we can just go ahead and uh, look at this list automatically every day. And if there is a prevent or fix issue or plan for change, we uh, send an email or create a task or whatever we need to do to handle this then we can evaluate the impact and uh, assess from there. Yeah, I think that was everything from me, but you can also, I uh, maybe have one thing to show you as well. If you want to be uh, certain that you don't uh, uh, meet up at your office Monday morning and all the services from Microsoft has exploded, it's also a possibility just to uh, follow up this uh, schedule a script to run uh, each night to check all the services are in a healthy state. And you can do that in Boost by uh, creating your script and schedule uh, executions for, uh, for the scripts that you need or entire projects as well. So, yeah. I think that was everything for me. Back to you, Evie. Great, thank you, both of you guys. That was uh, super information. Um, and thanks everyone for your questions. We presented so much information, we, did, we only got to one question, but we will take all of the questions that you sent and we will definitely follow up with them, we promise you. I have a couple of practical things things to sign off with um wait are you giving me guys are you guys giving me the signal that okay uh right after we end this session i just want to tell you guys you're going to get a survey asking if you'd like a free evaluation if you are interested in learning more about automated boost after seeing nick's demo then this is your chance so um what is an uh what is a free evaluation you can see kind of what it consists of here and uh, so send us a message from that survey and we'll get back to you. Um, finally, here are our contact details. You can also find us at apista.com. You can also see more about Boost at automatedboost.com. We are always happy to share our experience. It's part of why we do this. So please let us know if we can help you in any way. And with that, I will end this webinar and say, Thanks to all of you and you all have a good day. Bye for now.